Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Well, Aaron, you came through for us this winter. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. We got some good snow and it's held around for the longest I can remember in a long time. Yeah, it took a little while to get that snow going this year. I certainly didn't see much of it in December and January, but February sort of brought it on uh, like gangbusters. You know, we uh, really doubled and even tripled our um, snowfall to, to, to this point in the season throughout the month of February. So, yeah, it, we, we finally had some cold air really combined with, uh, you know, a southern um, stream of moisture and it provided a, a few opportunities of snowfall and course we had the cold temperatures from the polar vortex around that really helped uh, keep that snow around for quite a while probably the longest that we've seen in a while actually uh, February was was quite chilly you know about the fifth I think the coldest in the last five years uh, as far as Ohio goes but we'll get into that in a little bit yeah I think it was a good year for me to make the $20 investment on some really used cross-country skis (laughs) got to put them to good use but Dr. Aaron Wilson joining us today, a familiar voice on our podcast. Why don't you introduce yourself if we have some first-time listeners? Yeah, so uh, Aaron Wilson, I am with the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center uh, at The Ohio State University, and I'm also with OSU Extension, uh, engaging with the agricultural community throughout Ohio, talking about weather, climate, climate change, or anything that you want to talk about uh, with regards to the atmosphere. Uh, and certainly love coming on the show with Amanda and, and Elizabeth here to talk about uh, weather and agriculture. Yeah, so you guys have hinted at it a little bit here, um, but this winter was was a little interesting. At first, I was losing faith in your prediction of snowfall, um, but it did eventually come through. Could you step back and just give us an overview of the unique conditions we experienced going well, since the last time we talked? Yeah, so, you know, when we were uh, together in the fall, we were looking at an upcoming season that certainly was looking like it would feature what we call La Nina pattern. So those are uh, cooler than average sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific Ocean. Uh, Typically what that brings to the Ohio Valley is an active storm pattern uh, with uh, highly variable conditions. And um, so that's what we were sort of anticipating, certainly after the first of the year, that's typically when it gets kind of uh, kicking up just a bit. And certainly by February, we we typically see those conditions kick in. And you know, it took a long time really to see that type of pattern play out. Uh, Relatively speaking, December and January, though we had a few storms here and there, were relatively benign. Um, They were warm. Um, December was the 31st warmest December on record for the last 126 years. And January was the 30th warmest. So we were really uh, pretty warm heading through the first couple of months of winter. Uh, They were also very dry. Uh, So 33rd driest December and 40th driest January on record. So kind of unusual. It wasn't really anticipated with the La Nina conditions. I thought it would get going a lot sooner. Uh, But, you know, conditions really did start to change once we kind of flipped into February. Uh, we saw temperatures in February, some five to nine degrees below average. Like I said, the coldest February that we've seen for the last five or six years. Uh, but overall, if you take uh, you know, a warm start to your winter and you end winter on a very cold note, we divide by two and we have close to average conditions in the climate books. Uh, there's some pockets of above and below average across the state, but generally speaking, it will go down as a near average winter as far as temperatures go. Uh, we, we did stay dry relatively, uh, you know, with cold temperatures around uh, throughout much of February, we did stay pretty much on the dry side. We saw precipitation between 50 uh, to 75 percent of normal across the northern third to two thirds portion of the state. Uh, a lot of that was in frozen precip and we were able to build up a snowpack, as Amanda mentioned. We had a pretty good snowpack across the entire state, a good four to 15 inches, really. Uh, all across the state. So, you know, overall, it, w- it will go down as a dry winter and a and a near average winter in terms of our temperature. Yeah, that snowpack ended up, I think, being a, a really important part of how this winter panned out and how we'll think back on it. I remember being scared for a while. You kept talking about how we were going to have a severe drop in temperatures once February arrived. 
And if we wouldn't have gotten that snowpack, I would have been incredibly worried about our forages and small grains. Um, that, like what we saw a few years ago where we lost a lot of acres due to those low temperatures, but we got really lucky and it was nice and insulated under a snow blanket for those cold temperatures. Yeah, Elizabeth, you bring up another great point too. You know, we we um, we only had about one or two nights when we had the snowpack around where temperatures dropped below or close to zero. Um, and, and typically when we get those deep snowpacks in the wintertime, we can get a good um, long stretch of very, very cold temperatures. And we didn't see that this year because of the, we had the frequent light snow and clouds around, which help also, just like the snow is kind of insulating those covers and the wheat underneath it, the clouds are insulating the atmosphere and the surface as well. So that energy is not able to escape to space. The clouds radiate that energy back down. And so we kept temperatures, you know, relatively balmy in the low to mid teens. Uh, but certainly that kept us from really bottoming out. We only had that one night where we had widespread below zero temperatures across the state. So uh, it could have been much colder. In fact, it was very much a, a worst case scenario for those folks out in Oklahoma and Texas for sure. Yeah, I hate to talk about it too much because I don't know if we're quite out of the woods yet. I mean, we've seen some cold weather in March before, but thinking back on it, yeah, we didn't really have, there's a couple of nights, you know, I'm like, oh, I got to bring the barn cat on the porch or worried about the chickens or whatever. But, you know, that was nice how we kept getting that cloud cover and um, I sent you a picture, I think both of you, that one day, it wasn't one of the coldest days, but there was like a 10 degree temperature difference between the ground temperature underneath the snow and um, the air temperature one morning. So that was pretty cool to see too. Yeah, absolutely. That snow really helps insulate the ground, um, keeps those frost depths pretty shallow as well, which, you know, some folks probably wanted a little bit deeper frost to help break some of the ground up. But you know, there's trade-offs. Uh, I think folks would rather keep their covers and their wheat around as well. So uh, certainly, you know, um, a condition that that could have been a lot worse here in Ohio, but relatively speaking, you know, I think we all had enough winter that we can leave it behind us pretty shortly here and, and head into spring. Yeah, I was kind of sad when I saw the snow was going to melt, but then that first warm day we had, I was like, oh, I kind of got spring fever ready to get going on some things outside. It's amazing how cold 50 degrees feels in November and how warm it feels <laughs> in February, right? Completely yeah, that's different. right. Another um, thing we've been kind of watching is cover crop breakdown this winter, and I don't know if any of our listeners follow our YouTube channel as well, but you mentioned how that, that warm weather kind of held around and when we did our video back in January, we'd really not had a lot of cold days. And some of those crops you expected to winter kill were still pretty green. Of course, they had a lot of growth on them. But now that the snow's melted off, I'm anxious to get back out there and see what they look like. You know, you mentioned we were a little bit dry going into winter, um, still some dry areas, Northwest Ohio maybe, um, but, what did that rain, that snowfall really do for us as far as a rainfall equivalent and kind of getting back into normal conditions? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned that, that things were pretty dry across the state for the winter time. And um, I, I would say that Northwest Ohio has been the driest. It's really been a, a lingering dry area now. Uh, since last summer, you know, we had about 38% of the state covered in moderate drought conditions at the end of July last year, and the Northwest really hasn't recovered. And if you think back to 2019, you know, you couldn't really get two different kind of years for Northwest Ohio between 2019 and 2020. Um, well, I guess you could have a lot worse drought, and thankfully we didn't. But uh, yeah, so, you know, with the, with the snow falling and, and colder temperatures and the snow, you know, staying above surface, None of that obviously was soaking into the soil. None of that was running off into our rivers. So throughout much of the month of March, we saw, you know, soil moisture values were still dropping. They were pretty dry. Uh, rivers and, and creeks and streams were pretty low. Uh, but, you know, over that three to five day period where the snow melted, you know, we basically released a good two to four inches of water equivalent from that snowpack uh, into the soil. And, and I, I think I mentioned, you know, um, 
in the fall we about this idea we had some capacity in our soils to withstand a, an above average precip winter which we didn't get overall uh, but we had some capacity to fill in you know and, and moisten up the soil a bit so um, that two to four inches was really good especially in those areas that have been really dry uh, so we've seen some small improvements um, along the southern periphery of what we call abnormally dry conditions, which uh, I think the, the farthest south right now, they basically extend from Putnam down to about Auglaise County and then back up to uh, Wood, Seneca and Sandusky counties. So that area and then to the north and west has been really dry. But with the snow melt, that, that's improved things. So we've seen our rivers come up. Uh, a few ice jams here and there as well, you know, with all the ice as cold as temperatures were. So we've had some minor flooding with that, uh, but not not too bad. And then, of course, you know, we've had a still an active pattern over the last couple of weeks. It's brought pretty uh, heavy rainfall across our southern tier of counties, anywhere from two to four inches, upwards of five inches in some places over the last two weeks. Uh, so they've gone from a, a deep snowpack in southern Ohio to flooding conditions along all the streams and tributaries, and now even some minor flooding along the Ohio River. So uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing how quickly we've shifted from a deep winter scene to very much a spring flood concern uh, around here. So I would say we've got a pretty strong gradient right now as we head into our upcoming planning season of drier than normal conditions across Northwest Ohio to wetter than average conditions across our Southern counties. You mentioned earlier that this active pattern has really kind of taken hold here. You know, how hard is it as we start looking into March and April and May and start thinking about getting planters out, how hard is it going to be for us to break that active pattern and find a window? Yeah, I mean, the, the honest truth is, you know, we're, we're looking at the signals here at the beginning of March and, you know, they're looking pretty soggy for our upcoming planting season. Um, and and I, I would let me hedge that a little bit. We're looking at normal to above average precip for March through May. Um, these are outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center, but also with the fact that we still have La Nina conditions around, which does bring an active storm system or a storm pattern, uh, again, with highly variable conditions. So just like Amanda said, you know, we're just getting into March. This is our thaw, but uh, winter is probably not completely done with us just yet. Um, and, and, you know, if we think about last year, we had, we don't want to see those late season freezes in May again. Um, but certainly that's always on the table, right? So, but as we, we look here, you know, uh, in the, looking in the crystal balls, a meteorologist thinking about the upcoming season, um, it certainly looks like it's going to be wetter than average throughout March and into April and even May, and probably lingering into the first part of summer as well. After that, then signals start to change just a bit. I mean, I'm absolutely fine with the rain holding on in early summer, as long as we get that planting window sometime in really early May. And yeah, let's not talk about winter. I'm I'm already daydreaming about my garden. So warm temperatures from here on out, please, Erin. <laughs> I'll do my best. And I saw in the corn newsletter that Jim Knoll had, was writing about the Western Corn Belt carrying drought over. So that's probably something we keep the keep our eyes on, especially for markets and how that's going to play out for us in Ohio. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the dry conditions have returned to the western United States. Um, you know, we've seen these frequent multi-year droughts in the Four Corners regions and the desert southwest. And, and again, just like northwest Ohio, you know, parts of Dakotas just a couple of years ago, along the Missouri Basin, for instance, were completely underwater. I mean, no one was able to even get in. And now they're dealing with conditions where they've got some severe drought conditions across much of the Dakotas, down through Nebraska, Kansas, uh, and points west. And, and what, we'll, what we'll look for and watch over the upcoming season uh, is how far eastward will that shift? How, how far eastward will that drought migrate? Uh, but it's certainly, I think it, you know, Again, just like I think we'll remain wet through the winter season, there is some relief for the upper Midwest, but not so much for the Central Plains. And so it's likely they, they, they get into some pretty intense drought conditions this upcoming summer. And like you said, uh, that could then, you know, have some market ramifications on, on commodities and, and, and things like that. So again, I'm still watching the area from Northwest Ohio that's 
kind of back through central Illinois as well. If we don't get rid of that this spring, and I said the same thing in the fall, uh, if we don't get rid of that this spring, um, then once we get into the height of the growing season, we'll likely have some drought conditions return here as well. Uh, although it's, it's way too early to talk about that. Well, I guess the good news is we're predicting a warmer than average spring, right? So hopefully that'll help get that planting window like Elizabeth mentioned, even if we are wetter. I mean, we've been dealing with wet. It's not good when it's wet and cold. Yeah, you're right. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked about on this show and, 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 and elsewhere is we're not, um, you know, wet springs are not new to us. This is something that we've seen in our trends over the last 50 to, to 70 years, a, a, an increasing trend in spring precipitation, an increasing trend in the heavier downpours as well. Uh, so, you know, we're learning, we're really learning together how to adapt our agriculture and our farming to this type of situation. Uh, that being said, projecting warmer than average temperatures, you know, doesn't preclude having those windows of opportunity. Uh, and I think I, I feel almost like a broken record, but about this time every year, I say, you know, once you get to mid-April and, and beyond, you know, be ready to go when you've got to go, right? Uh, it's not something that we can, you know, when the conditions are right and your fields are in good condition, then you've got to go, you've got to roll because uh, with the variable conditions that we have, we just can't assume that we're going to have a nice window open up two or three weeks later, you know, so take those opportunities when you find them and, um, I, you know, we'll get through it together. Yeah, OSU Extension has put out a lot of programming this winter about, you know, a program you were involved with planning, Aaron, you know, farming with weather extremes, Precision U focused on that shortened planting window. So we do have some great resources available um, that you can check out. All of those programs have been recorded and Amanda mentioned our YouTube channel earlier. You can find them, find them on our YouTube channel. Well, as always, Aaron, thank you. Really appreciate the time and the effort you put into tracking these patterns and filling us in. Right? I think we all find the records interesting and looking back at that. And then, of course, what to expect moving forward. Well, it's always a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to doing our, our beginning of summer check-in. We'll see what the spring gave us. And hopefully, we'll get those windows. Everybody will be in and we'll be heading to a great growing season. Hey, podcast listeners, just a reminder to give us a like or subscribe so you know when we release new episodes. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to leave us a review also. We appreciate the comments. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.